20th chapter as you remain standing in the ninth verse. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. This morning's uh, sermonic insertion brings us to sermon number 47 uh, in our series of 100 sermons to uh, carry us from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, 50 from the Old Testament, 50 from the New Testament. So this being 47 out of 100, 47 out of 50 as it makes reference to the Old Testament. Jeremiah 20, uh, verse 9 and this morning, uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version uh, of the Scriptures. And it reads, But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. Amen. You may be seated uh, in the presence of the Lord. I want that you would consider uh, this thought this morning. Faith evidenced in complaint. Faith evidenced or uh, demonstrated in complaint. My brothers and sisters, in the 1960s, a very prominent preacher by the name of John Claypool. And John Claypool in the 60s at that time was pastoring Crescent Hill Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and on one particular Sunday morning, John Claypool was wrestling, uh, wrestling with uh, his call to ministry. He was questioning God and even uh, questioning his existence. John Claypool was preaching for the preachers each and every Sunday, but something uh, on that previous week transpired in his life that literally made him not want to preach on that particular Sunday. And what had happened was his eight-year-old daughter had been experiencing some illnesses and they had taken her through a battery test. And on that previous week, they found out, he and his wife, that his daughter had been diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, John Claypool sat in his office and he literally told the Lord, Lord, I don't want to preach today. So I really don't know if I want to preach anymore because he said, I I'm really beginning to question my, my service to you. Because in my service to you, how is it uh, that you can allow my eight-year-old daughter to be diagnosed with such a serious illness? And so I really, he cried out and complained to God and said, in light of the revelations and what has taken place in my life, I really don't want to come out of my office and I don't want to preach today. He began to question God. He began to ask God, why would you allow this to happen to me and my family? And he even began to question his existence. But as John Claypool sat at his desk in his office on Sunday morning, as he cried out and complained to God, God called upon him to shift from the shock and the numbness of what he had just found out and what had been disclosed. And God told him that he would have to learn how to live in the shadow of what was going on in his life and still continue to serve the Lord. My brothers and sisters, it is not what you do to, it, it is not what you do to life that is as, what you do to life is just as important and perhaps more important than what life actually does to you. We are not free to choose what happens to us circumstantially speaking. But we are free to choose how we will respond to circumstances that are presented to us in our life. Life, my brothers and sisters, is a perennial interaction between events in our life and our responses to events. And we must understand the future of our life will always emerge out of what is going on in our present scenario. The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is very easy to live reflecting on yesterday. It is very easy to live contemplating about tomorrow. But the question is, what is God going to do for me today? As I'm living, Lord, are you sufficient to meet my needs even for today? Life, my brothers and sisters, can deal many of us some very ambiguous packages. I mean, packages when we see them coming, packages when we have them in our hand. We are literally saying, Lord, I know 
what's inside the package. And not only what's inside the package, but what bothers me most of all is that it was delivered to me by you. It came to me by your hand. It was delivered to me by your hand. It, it is addressed as coming from you to me. God, it's a package that I do not want to open. It is an ambiguous package. Package that reminds us or has us to see that a loved one has gone on to glory. A package that tells us that we've lost a job. Literally, our whole world has been turned upside down. So brothers and sisters, whenever we find ourselves in a situation like John Claypool, we find ourselves in a scenario where life deals us hand that we would rather not have, or even like Dr. H. Beecher Hicks, the pastor of the Metropolitan Baptist Church in D.C., has a book entitled Preaching Through a Stone. And at that particular moment in his life, when he penned the book, Dr. Hicks was going through a severe illness in his own family with one of his loved ones battling cancer. And church was going through a storm. And he was going through a storm. And like Dr. Claypool, he was saying, Lord, I'm beginning to question my service to you. I'm beginning to even question who you are. And not only that, I'm questioning my own existence. My brothers and sisters, this is where we find Jeremiah. Jeremiah is questioning his call, questioning his service to God, questioning God himself, and questioning even his own existence. Harry Emerson Fosdick once wrote, a man can put off making up his mind, but he cannot put off making up his life. And my brothers and sisters, this is the realism of the Bible. We can put off making up our mind, but we cannot put off living life. Centuries ago, a philosopher by the name of Descartes climbed into a stove, and he determined as he climbed into the stove that he would think about life before he acted. So the philosopher climbed into a stove and said, I'm going to think about life. I'm going to contemplate life. I'm going to plan out life before I live life. My brothers and sisters, therefore he came up with the phrase, I think, therefore I am. My brothers and sisters, the words of this philosopher were very tragic and fatal to even modern thought because it told something that is in a direct contradiction to the Bible. We do not think and then we live. We do not understand and then we live. The realism of the Bible is that we live and we understand. The songwriter said we'll understand it better by and by. We don't stop, understand, and then move. The Bible says we live for God and we understand as we are living for God. So my brothers and sisters, as believers, we don't think and therefore we are. We are and therefore we think. The challenge, my brothers and sisters, to go on living, even though we have no answers or explanations, is a very difficult challenge. But Jeremiah helps us to understand there are times when we must go on. The Bible always arranges life and thought in just that sequence, life and then thought. As a matter of fact, we all must understand that life must be lived forward but it can only be understood backwards. Dr. Robert Smith, Beeson Divinity School, said that all of us, like Jeremiah, we find ourselves living in the in-betweenness of life, in the in-betweenness of life, when we are facing literally two inescapable realities. We cannot go on, but we cannot give up. An escapable reality. We cannot continue, but we cannot stop. And Jeremiah is at such a point in his life where Jeremiah is complaining but has confidence. He's sighing but he's singing at the same time. And that is the paradox of faith in God. That we can complain to God but still have faith in God. We can cry out to God but still sing praises to God. The life of faith is not an absence of adversity, my brothers and sisters, but the life of faith promises that we will have assistance 
in adversity. When we read the 20th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, we find Jeremiah literally on an emotional roller coaster. We find Jeremiah questioning his calling, questioning God, questioning even his existence. As a matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah, we know more about Jeremiah than any of the other Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah 1 verse 1 says he's the son of Hilkiah. His father was a priest. It says he was from an area of Anatoth or the tribe of Benjamin. We know this about Jeremiah. It says Jeremiah, he, he was a prophet during the reign of Josiah. And in 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 21, we find the historical context for the ministry of Jeremiah. Because Josiah, literally, although he was not perfect, was one of the better kings that ruled over the southern kingdom or the nation of Judah. Josiah literally became king of the nation of Judah at eight years of age. And the Bible says that he reigned for 30 some odd years. But in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, we find Jeremiah comes on the scene with a prophetic ministry that lasted literally 40 years. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, the complaining prophet, the lamenting prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet who was often ostracized because he was not preaching a popular message. He was not preaching to meet people's felt needs. God called Jeremiah before he was born and said, I'm going to use you to pluck out, to build up, to tear down. You will not have a message that everybody wants to hear, but a message that everybody needs to hear. So Jeremiah, in preaching this message, finds himself in a situation that's not good. Jeremiah chapter 20, my brothers and sisters, tells us there was a priest, a contemporary, a colleague, Jeremiah, by the name of Pasher. And Pasher's name literally means fruitful. And Pasher, his name being fruitful, was a priest who, although the children of Israel were idolaters, although the children of Israel had turned their hearts away from God, Pasher was still telling them everything is going to be all right. Pasher was a priest who had sold out to a popularity gospel. And even though the people were not honoring God, were not serving God in sincerity and truth, Pasher, whose name means fruitful, was telling him, I know Jeremiah is telling you that if you don't repent, you're not going to get right with God. I know Jeremiah is telling you that God is going to judge you, but I want to tell you that God is going to bless you anyhow. Jeremiah kept preaching that unpopular gospel. And I think I ought to put a footnote here. We cannot compromise what God wants us to say. Because God does not call us to preach a popular gospel, but an unpopular gospel. Somebody talk to me here today. Jeremiah began to preach that unpopular gospel. And his numbers continued to decline. His invitations continued to decrease. And so finally, Pastor said, I want you to take Jeremiah, put him in prison, put him in stocks. I want you to beat him. I want you to scorn him. And then when Jeremiah gets out of prison, Jeremiah tells Pastor, no matter what you do to me, I'm not going to stop preaching what God told me to say. As a matter of fact, you'll find in verse 3, that Jeremiah told Pastor, he said, the Lord told me to tell you, your name is no longer Pasher, which means fruitful, but your name is Magor Misabit, which means terror on every side. In other words, God wants Pasher to understand that God is the one who is sovereign, and God who is the one who is in control. But yet Jeremiah, being faithful to the call of God on his life, he begins to complain to God in verse 7. In verse 7, Jeremiah says, God, wait a minute. You deceived me. You fooled me. You called me from my mother's womb. You said you would put words in my mouth. You said you were going to bless me. You said that your hand was going to be upon me. I've been faithful to you, and look what happened. God, you have deceived me. And God said, Jeremiah, I didn't deceive you. I said that when you come and follow me, I will watch over you and I will protect you because following me faithfully will bring you literally 
derision. And Jeremiah says, God, I hear what you're saying. But God, there's sometimes when serving you is hard. There are times when I'm serving you, God, that I literally want to give up. God tells Jeremiah, you need to understand that I'm a providence God. I'm a God that watches over you. Literally, the providence of God or the sovereignty of God, my brothers and sisters, is a lot like the Hebrew language. And God chose the Hebrew language to articulate to the world the Old Testament. And what makes the providence of God and the hand of God like the Hebrew language is the Hebrew language must be read from right to left. In other words, the Hebrew language is read backward. Not only is the Hebrew language read backward, the Hebrew language is a language that has only consonants and no vowels. So as you are reading the Hebrew language from right to left or reading it backward, and all you see are consonants, it does not make sense. And so as you are reading it backward, you've got to insert the vowels in order to understand what's going on. Somebody talk to me here today. And so as God is providentially watching over our life, we've got to live life and then read it backwards. And as we are living life, and reading it backwards, we insert the parts that God wants us to know as we are living our life and it begins to make sense what's going on in our life. So my brothers and sisters, God tells Jeremiah that literally I will fill in the blanks as we are going on and as we are living life, God. God tells us that we must live life passionately, openly, and then use our minds by faith to understand and interpret what we have experienced. If we try to put understanding before the living of life, we become immobilized in the process, my brothers and sisters, literally locks up. We don't first get the answers and then live them in light of our understanding, but in light of our living, we must try to understand. The Bible in faith keep us from a superficial existence and a superficial faith. Because a superficial existence will allow us to label things too quickly. A superficial faith will allow us to jump to wrong conclusions. But faith is a lot like, or living by faith is a lot like an iceberg. An iceberg only shows you a fraction of what is there. The events are always much deeper than they appear. And so the Bible reminds us that despair is always presumptuous. Doubt is always presumptuous because we don't know what lies in the not yet. But God knows what lies in the not yet. And when we have faith in God, even in our complaining, the Bible gives us a depth perspective that we cannot see all by ourselves. Faith depicts a God from whom something good, my brothers and sisters, can always be expected. Jeremiah lived a life which said that Jeremiah was convinced of the sovereignty of God over nations and even over events. John Claypool, who I alluded to at the beginning of my message, as he was lying there in his office or sitting in his office, not wanting to preach, questioning God, and even complaining to God. And complaining to God, my brothers and sisters, is not a lack of faith. Because when we go through the Bible, we find many of those art and characters of faith were men and women who complained to God. Jonah complained to God. David complained to God. You'll find none of the prophets in the Bible who did not complain to God. Moses complained to God. But in the midst of their complaining, they were demonstrating faith in God. John Claypool says that our faith is evidenced in complaint. If we'll literally think about two circles, one circle being a larger circle, and inside the larger circle, John Claypool says there is a smaller circle. Now, the larger circle, he said, represents God's providence. The smaller circle represents our freedom and the events that take place in our life. And John Claypool, sitting at his desk, was able to stand up and go out and preach because he realized the small circle was inside the big circle. 
and he realized the big circle can take anything that comes out of the little circle and do something good with it. My brothers and sisters, if your life is inside a much bigger circle, if your life is in the hands of God, no matter what event transpires in your life, God can take the events of your life and work them out for your good. And that's the encouragement we receive from Jeremiah. Jeremiah reminds us that God is a sovereign God over all circumstances and all events of life. And Jeremiah even reminds us, even in his living, that God's hand will always be on those who are faithful in serving him and keeping God uppermost in their activities and in their living. My brothers and sisters, the Bible uh, in Jeremiah chapter 20, chapter 20 is connected to chapter 18 and chapter 19. And God in chapter 18 had told Jeremiah the story of the parable, the pot and the clay. And God was trying to let Jeremiah know not only about the nation, but, but about his own individual life. That as long as you are in my hand, you may become marred, you may become scratched, you may get beat up by the circumstances of life, but ultimately you are in my hand. And if you're in my hand, even though you get wounded while in my hand, understand that you're in my hand and I'm allowing you to be wounded and I'm the one that's going to heal you and make you right. My brothers and sisters, there's somebody here today whom life has beaten up, somebody whom life has wounded, and you are not in his hand and you are trying to fix the scars and mend the broken pieces all by yourself. But I want you to understand, there is one by the name of Jesus who hung, bled, and died on the cross so that you might be in the Father's hand. And so when life beats you up, he can put you back together again. As we open the doors of the church and extend the invitation, after the presentation of the gospel, it affords us an opportunity to let someone know whom life uh, has come and has no answers and no explanations. That God is the one who's come to give you life and give you life more abundantly through his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we stand all over the building, we invite you to come to Jesus. Church family, let us pray for those who are lost and unsaved, that at this moment, certainly they will come and give their heart and their life to God in Christ. For those we're here and know that you are redeemed, set free, filled with the Holy Spirit, but without a church home. This invitation is for you to become a member of this local church. Won't you come? Come to Jesus.